Welcome everybody to Cryo, the runtime control room. I'm Sasha, one of the maintainers of Cryo, and today I have the pleasure to be here with Urvashi. Hello everyone, my name is Urvashi Munani. I'm a software engineer at Red Hat working in the container runtime space, and I'm a maintainer of Cryo, and I'm here today with Peter. Hey there, my name is Peter Hunt. I'm a software engineer at Red Hat, primarily working on Cryo, Podman, and Kanban. Uh, and I'm also here with Renal. Hi everyone, I'm Renal Patel. I'm also a software engineer at Red Hat and I'm a cryo maintainer. Welcome everyone. So what is cryo? Cryo is a container runtime that implements the Kubernetes container runtime interface using open container initiative images and runtimes. It means that cryo supports pulling OCI compatible images and running them with OCI compatible runtimes such as RunC or CRun. The projects that make up Cryo, such as containers image, storage, Podman, and RunC are continually pushing the envelope of container technology in Linux as they keep integrating new features added to the kernel. Cryo balances stability for the core CRI features that Kubernetes needs while adding knobs to improve security as well as incubate new features. This talk is about how a Cryo admin sitting in the control room, so to speak, is able to configure cryo feature to make your clusters more secure out of the box as well as provide knobs for you to try out new features such as user namespaces. We will cover all the different ways that cryo and the workloads running on cryo can be configured. So without any more delay, let's begin. All right, I would like to talk to you about the basic configurations of cryo. So most People will look at etc cryo cryo.conf, which is the main configuration file, and it's written in Toml. So every configurable part of cryo can be set there. Everything we can adjust also via the command line interface can be done in this configuration file. So for example, we can specify the, the storage driver and the storage root. We can also set which underlying OCI runtime should be chosen. For example, we can switch from run C to C run. We can also adapt some security related configurations like setting the default seccom profile and the default app armor profile or the default capabilities which should apply to all workloads. And we also have the possibility to have some more debugging helpers like setting the log level or the log level filter. Right now we are working on making those configurations dynamically reloadable. And we are we're introducing a modular configuration approach, which allows us to separate one, the single configuration file into multiple ones. So how does this work? So Cryo supports dynamic configuration, which works that we just have to send the SIG hangup to the server, and then the server will reload the options. So this works for features like the default app armor profile or the seccom profile and it also works for the log level and the log level filter if we configure system d to uh, automatically sen send sync hang, hang up um, on reload then we can just run yeah system ctl system ctl cryo reload so for the drop-in configurations um, per default, we defined a new directory, which is an etc cryo cryo.conf.d. And for example, if we specify the toml table like cryo.runtime, then we can set the log level and override it to debug. So those configuration files um, are in alphabetically order processed. So it makes them easy to use if you prefix them with a number, for example. And uh, they also work with the dynamic configuration reload feature. And those drop-in configurations have a higher priority than the etc cryo cryo.conf, which gives administrators the possibility to deploy a default configuration and users can override those configurations by just having their drop-in configurations. And now I would like to demo that to you. So what we can see here, I will now start cryo with a configuration file in my local directory and I will unset the configuration directory because I, on my local machine, I ha already have etc cryo, cryo.conf.d available. Um, and to not have any effect on my demonstration, I will just put it to an empty string. So here we are. Cryo is loaded and seems to work. So we can now run something like cry ctlps. And yeah, we get an empty response because nothing is running. And cryo per default does not log 
that verbose. So the info verbosity uh, does not look at all, does not look that much at all. Um, we can see we are probably more or less bound to warnings or info messages which are related to the CNI network. So to change that, we can go into our cryo configuration and go to the log level and set it to debug. Then we save it. In my demo, I will now restart cryo. And here we can see that we are now in debugging mode. And if we now run any RPC request, then we can see that everyone, every request is locked. So, and those log files can be pretty huge in the end because the verbosity is now really, really high. And to have a better debugging possibility, we added something like a log level filter. So for example, we now can go into our cryo configuration and change the log level. This is a regular expression. It works, for example, we can change it as case insensitive regular expression and go for request. And now let's just, we don't have to restart cryo at all. We can just um, reload cryo. We are sending a zig hang up like this. Cryo also gives us the indicator that we reloaded the configuration. So it reloads the configuration, it updates uh, the configuration file, and we can also see, okay, the log filter is now set to request. And if we now run cryctl, then we can see that we only really log the requests. And this way administrators can, for example, really good filter on those log messages. What do we, what can we do for the drop-in configuration files? We can also start cryo by changing the configuration file directory to my local directory and then cryo comes to D. And if we do that, then we can see that in this directory, for example, is a log file, a log modification file, which uh, resets the log filter. So in the configuration file, we change the log level filter to log only the requests. And in this over override file, we just unset it again. And if we now run cryctl, then we can see that we get all data, not only the requests, we also get the responses. For example, here we have the list image response which lists all the images available on my local machine. And that's it for my little demo. And now I would like to hand over back to Urashi. So Cryo uh, uses the container storage library to manage um, copy and write file systems for containers and the containers image library for pulling images from container registries. Uh, these libraries are also shared across our other container tools like Bond and Build Up and Scopio. So having a shared backend means that we can also share configuration files. Uh, so to give an example, let's say I want to block um, image pulls from a specific registry. So instead of having to configure this for each container tool that I use, I can just put it in a shared file that all the container tools can access. Uh, so we have three shared files like this. The first one is the registries.conf file, uh, which is used to configure anything related to your registries. So users can go there to configure the insecure registries, block registries, their list of unqualified search registries, as well as mirror setup. Uh, the second file is the policy.json file. Um, this file holds policy requirements for a container image, uh, specifically around where you're pulling the image from. Uh, so you can have policy requirements for various transports, including trusted keys and image signatures. The third file is the storage.conf file. Uh, this is used for configuring options for your container storage. So stuff, as, stuff like your driver, your run route, your graph route, um, et cetera. And now Mrna will talk about container, the networking configuration. So Cryo uses CNI for configuring networking for Kubernetes pods. CNI is widely adopted as a networking solution in Kubernetes. So CNI configuration mainly consists of two settings. One is the part to the directory in which the configuration is stored. And the second is where the plugin binaries are stored. So you can see in the example on the slide, we have a network dir and a plugin dirs option for both of these settings. In addition, we also support setting the default network uh, if you intend to do so. And then Cry also supports bootstrapping networking to daemon sets. 
So you can have a daemon set that copies over the configuration and the binaries to these directories and cryo will pick up the configuration. So any pods that start up after that configuration will pick up uh, the CNI settings. In addition to all of these options that, uh, you know, in the cryo, comp, cryo also has the ability to uh, edit the runtime classes and handlers. So in Kubernetes, uh, you know, differing workloads have differing needs of performance and security and uh, their users need a way to toggle between different runtimes. So in, uh, so Kubernetes has this, uh, has this feature runtime classes, which is slated to be GA in 1.20, which asks the CRI implementation to use a different runtime, or users can also make it use runtimes differently. Admins then have the ability to create runtime classes and, uh, uh, as optionally add emission controllers or policies to gate them for different uses. This gives a lot of uh, verbosity for the amount of uh, ways that admins can configure the way that <clears throat> their users uh, can use differing uh, runtimes for differing workloads. So in the bottom left here, you can see that this is a basic runtime class uh, example and um, the runtime class name needs to correspond with one of the runtimes in the runtimes table. So perhaps the runtime class name would be run C high performance. And then a pod would, uh, and then, so, and we'll go into a little bit more in detail. On the right, we have an example of a couple of different ways that you can configure cryo to have different runtimes. And we'll go into a bit more in detail. But we have the generic run C, we have a run C that uh, configures high performance for uh, CPU balancing. We have RunC that allows uh, user NS annotation. And then we have uh, Kata, which uh, provides a bit more security as it's a kernel separated container. In addition to uh, all of the ways that you can configure your crowd, there's also the pod annotation, which is a pretty generic feature, uh, generally known in Kubernetes, but I'm just gonna real quick go over it. Uh, it's you know, gen a generic key value uh, map in uh, the pod metadata, and it allows for passing through of unstructured data to varying levels of the stack. What this allows us to do is uh, Cryo has some specific annotation, uh, user NS mode annotation and shim size annotation. And these annotations allow um, admins to, or users to request differing uh, configurations of the runtime, and then Cryo can use those annotations uh, to uh, to configure the runtime as long as that user is allowed to do that. And we'll go into a user NS, uh, mode annotation example a little bit. But first, in summary, admins have the ability to configure cryo in a varying number of ways, storage, image, networking, uh, all of these varying options. In addition to that, they have the ability to uh, add runtime classes to restrict varying behavior uh, that the run, that cryo configures the runtime to do. And in addition to that, they have the ability to make different uh, controllers gate runtime classes or annotations before they reach cryo, which uh, gives the ability for admins to have a lot of power in configuring their uh, Kubernetes nodes for all their varying use cases and workloads. So now we're gonna have the first example of that. We're gonna have or does she talk about a runtime class topology? Yeah, um, thanks, Vidal. So we can use the runtime class topology as well as pod annotations um, to disable CPU load balancing for certain containers that are using high performance runtimes. Uh, the way this is done is that a pre-start hook is run to disable load balancing on the CPU specified in the pod spec. Uh, and then a pre-stop hook is run to enable load balancing on those CPUs once the pod is about to be stopped. Um, so this is helpful in workloads where the expense of context switching cannot be tolerated. So the user, uh, the admin of the user gets the privilege to disable CPU load balancing on certain CPUs. Um, so I have a quick demo on how this is done. Okay, so in this demo here, I have an OpenShift cluster. Um, so the first thing that I did with my cluster was I created a machine config object that drops in a uh, config file at cryo.conf.d called 99runtimes.config.conf. Um, so in this config file, I am 
uh, configuring my runtime class, my high performance runtime class. Uh, so that was just the base 64 content. So we can go on the node now to see what the file actually looks like um, under the cry.conf.d folder. And we can see here that I have created a, a, a runtime called high performance here. Um, this is important because we will be creating a runtime class using OC uh, and Cryo needs to know uh, that there is a high performance runtime that exists. So it knows to run the three stop and three stop hooks. Um, so since we're already on the node, we can check the value of the flags for the various CPUs that I have on this node. Um, this is important to keep in mind uh, what the value here is. So 4783 and 4655 because once we disable load balancing um, on the CPU, uh, the value will drop by one. Um, the other thing that I did was uh, I created a kubelet config CR uh, to update the CPU manager policy to static. Um, so this allows me to request whole CPUs um, on certain nodes um, exclusively. Uh, so if you can see in the kubelet.com file here, um, when you scroll down right, here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it was set to static. Um, so now the next thing is um, I created a runtime class, a high performance runtime class. Um, the handler name is high performance and I called it high perf test. Uh, this is just a quick description of what the runtime class uh, looked like. Um, so now we are ready to create our pod um, where we would like to disable CPU load balancing. So here for the pod, I have the set the CPU load balancing cryo IO annotation to true. Um, I have set the runtime class name to the hyperf test runtime class that was created and I have requested two CPUs under my resources. Um, so the pod is up and running now. Uh, let's figure out which node it's running on so we can go on the node to uh, verify that uh, CPU load balancing was actually disabled on the two CPUs that the container got. Um, so first thing we have to find is the C group slice for that container so we can figure out the CPUs that it is using. So I'm just getting my container ID uh, and then finding the CPU set uh, C group. Okay, and we got the slice. And uh, we can see here that the CPU set are CPUs one and three. Those are the CPUs I got. Um, so we can check the value of the flag for these two CPUs now. Uh, yes, and here we can see that um, the values dropped down by one. It is 4782 and 4654 now for both CPU one and CPU three. Um, we can just take a look at CPU two, for example, um, to see what the, to double check the values that that one is still enabled and we didn't accidentally disable that. Um, so as you can see, it, the values are uh, greater than the disabled one. So we we successfully disabled CPU load balancing on the two CPUs that the pod got. Um, so now once the pod is done running, we don't leave the CPU load balancing disabled. We re-enable it with the pre-stop hook as I mentioned before. Uh, so let's quickly delete the pod here. And um, we'll go back on the node and check the same flag value again. So, yep, and then we're going to cat that value for CPU one and three. And yep, as you can see, it went back up. Uh, so, uh, load balancing on these two CPUs are enabled again. And that's all I have for my demo. All right, let's talk a bit about security related configurations. So, usually the container runtime interface defines the main behavior how a container runtime uh, which implements a Kubernetes API should behave. But this behavior is probably not always the most secure one. So for example, if we uh, specify a seccom profile and put it, in, put it into an empty string, then this will be considered as unconfined. And this applies to basically all workloads in the cluster who do not use the runtime default seccom profile or a localhost profile. So therefore, we decided to add a new configuration option, which is called seccomp use default when empty. And this should help us to increase the security defaults um, running on container runtimes. So turning this option on will, per default, use the runtime default seccomp profile, which ships with cryo, to all workloads who do not 
really specify something like unconfined or a localhost profile. And I prepared a demo for you to show it to you. So first of all, let's have a look at this new configuration option. So it's part of cryo.conf and um, we can just have a look into the description of the option and per default it, it's set to false. So if we now run cryo and for our demonstration purposes, we will unset the configuration directory and then create a Kubernetes workload. And then we can see that seccomp is not enabled on this workload. So we can just verify it by using uh, proc self status and seccom points to zero, so it's not enabled at all. So if we now create a drop-in configuration, which enables the features for us, then this would look like that, that we just have cryo.conf.d and we just override the seccom use default when empty to true. If we now run cryo uh, with that configuration directory and create a new Kubernetes workload, then we can verify now in the same way that seccomp is enabled for that workload. And this is a great enhancement to default security and is a good example of strong security defaults from my perspective. That's it for my demo. Thanks, Sasha. Um, so next, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about username spaces in Kubernetes and Cryo. So real quick, I'm just going to do a quick overview of username spaces for people who aren't aware. Uh, you can think of, of users in groups as people and the available range of IDs, all of them on the host is like a house. The username space is people living not in the full house, but in a little doll house uh, within the house as in a subset of the range of IDs. Um, without going too far into it, the, there are quite a few security advantages to um, username spaces. While inside the container, the process can think it's privileged and be given uh, privileges uh, from the perspective of the host, like uh, a process in a container can mount because it thinks that it's UID zero or root, but on the outside, it's actually an unprivileged process. And it, if uh, a container was able to break out, uh, then the uh, then it wouldn't actually be able to do anything on the host. Um, so it's much more secure to be able to run. Uh, any pause, any, any kind of privilege inside of a username space. So username spaces in Kubernetes has been a really long time issue. Uh, an original enhancement request in 2016 uh, was brought up about it, and it's been attempted to be implemented varying times throughout the last four years. And yet still, again, we have a, another cap in 2020 that describes how uh, we may be able to implement user namespaces again. So uh, that's the sad news. The happy news is that much like uh, PID limit, which was an option that Cryo introduced way at the beginning of Cryo to prevent fork bombs from DOSing a system, um, and that wasn't supported in Kubernetes until 119, I believe, or 118, somewhere around then, um, Cryo has added uh, support for username spaces before upstream cube has solidified on the implementation. And this allows uh, admins to play around with username spaces and use it. Um, but we make sure to uh, implement it in a way that's secure. So um, by what we did is we um, configure allowed. Uh, so there's a uh, username space um, annotation, cryo, uh, IO Kubernetes cryo user NS mode. And only uh, pods that run in certain runtime classes are allowed to interpret that annotation to actually be able to create a username space for the pod. And uh, that allows admins to uh, stop anyone from creating username space if they don't specify a runtime handler with a username space, or only allow some people to use username spaces through admission controllers policy or runtime classes. And then give anyone access to username spaces if they have the a lot of annotations in all of their runtime classes. So I'm going to do a quick demo on that. All right, so the demo. So we're gonna start off by just creating a, a vanilla Kubernetes cluster running cryo in it. And while this bootstraps, I'm gonna show a little bit more about what we're gonna be working with. So we're gonna start off with our uh, 
So this is our runtime class for the user NS. So notice um, we have the name run to user NS, and our allowed annotations is IO coordinates cryo user NS mode. So that means that this username space is allowed to interpret the IO Kubernetes cryo user NS mode to configure a username space for a newly created pod. Moving forward a little bit, then we're going to look at our three Kubernetes objects that we're going to create. So first we're going to create a runtime class, and that's going to use the handler run to user NS, and it's going to be called run user NS class. And any pod that wants to be able to have the user NS mode interpreted needs to use that class. We're going to then create a pod, um, user NS pod, and that is going to have uh, the auto um, late annotation for user NS mode. Auto just means um, ask the cryo to create a, a 65K um, sized uh, user namespace. Um, nothing super fancy, but it's sufficient for the majority of use cases and it allows cryo to do that good delegation. There are finer grain controls, but we're not going to go over that in this demo. Um, and this container is just going to sleep for a day um, and run a Fedora con container. And it's going to use the runtime class, user NS class, so it'll actually be allowed to do that. Um, then we're going to create also a not user NS pod. This one is going to attempt to get the annotation auto, but it's actually not going to work because uh, Cryo, um, because it isn't configured with the correct runtime class name, so Cryo will refuse to interpret the um, annotation. So it'll just be given the default user namespace. This allows the admins to have a finer green control. It's going to sleep for two days, and that'll allow us to differentiate the two uh, in uh, PS tree. So now we're going to wait for this cluster to come up. All right. And so now we're going to create our three pod objects. And we're, we'll check that they're running, which they are. So. Now we're going to look at the, so the way to check that a username space is running is check the UID map of the, um, of the PID. So we're going to find the PID of each of them. So remember, one day is our user NS pod and two days is our not user NS pod. So we're first going to look at our user NS pod and we're going to tap the uh, UID map of that pod. Now note here we have, so, the way that this file is structured is it has, so this is the U, beginning of the UID range and that's the end of the uh, UID range, or the beginning of the UID range with respect to the um, containers username space. And this is the beginning of the UID range from the respect of the host username space. So the container thinks that it's running in UID zero, but actually it's running in UID uh, 20,000. And that allows, and then there are 65K um, allocated IDs, which should be enough for our two PID um, pod. So this means that any pod, um, any uh, any process may think that it's root inside of the container and be able to do uh, things with elevated privileges from in the, inside the confines of the container, but from the perspective of the host, it's just some rando UID and it can't do anything fun. So if it uh, happens to break out, goodness forbid, then um, it won't really be able to do anything uh, that from its elevated capabilities from within the user name space. And here, just to demonstrate that it's gated on the runtime class, we're going to show the not user NS pod. So here we see from the perspective of the user name space, it's running as root, or its uh, UID map begins as root, and from the host begins as root, and this is just all of the available UIDs. So basically, what's happening is um, this pod is running in the host user name space. So if it uh, it's specified to run as a, if, if uh, the PID one in the container is running as root, then it's actual root on the host. And any, priv any privileges it has is, are the privileges from the perspective of the host. And notice how the, even though we attempted to give the annotation to the pod, it didn't work. It wasn't given the annotation. Or it wasn't, the annotation wasn't interpreted. So um, the username space wasn't created, and that meant an admin uh, stopped, um, you know, some user from creating a username space when they weren't supposed to, um, which uh, demonstrates fine grain control. And that is it for the demo. Oh, thank you for that awesome demo, Peter. Uh, so Cryo currently is an incubating project in the CNCF. Uh, the most recent version of Cryo is 1.19, and uh, we continue to walk in lockstep with the Kubernetes version. 
Uh, Cryo is stable and it is the container runtime that is being used by Suzy Caps and OpenShift 4X clusters and production. So what's in the future of Cryo? Um, as mentioned before, Cryo already has support for user namespaces as well as C groups V2. And we are working on pushing these features in upstream Kubernetes as well so that clusters can take advantage of it. Um, we are also moving some of Cryo components over to Rust to improve performance. And we see Cryo graduating in the near future. If you want to find out more about Cryo, um, here are some resources for you. Uh, we are available on Slack and IRC. Uh, and we have this awesome.md doc on our repo, which has links to past talks as well as any articles and resources around Cryo. Uh, and we also have a pretty cool coloring book that talks about the different container tools and how they work together. Uh, I think now we can open the floor to questions. Thank you.